high level of enthusiasm for what we are trying to do down there. And that is fantastic. And one of the hard lines of imperialism to have this huge breath of fresh air. It's just very invigorating. So thank you to you for organizing this and being here. Um, yes, I have to flee Chile. I was a bad boy. <laughs> um, the military coup took place on the 11th of September 1973. And I remember it vividly, and I will never forget it, if you can imagine. Um, it began at 5 o'clock in the morning when the military declared that it would not recognize the democratic elected government of Chile anymore. Um, but on 6 7, they've taken over just about everything. They have surrounded the presidential palace with tanks and they demanded the surrender of the president. Salvador Allende had the possibility of making a final speech and it was heard through one single radio, the Magallanes radio. And the reason why we only listened to that one was because the military had bombed all the other radio stations that they could. Therefore, there was no possibility. And he called us to come to defend the government, which we did. And it was very traumatic. I was younger. A lot younger. I have a lot of accumulated youth. <laughs> and I remember I went there and said goodbye to my mom. She said, look after yourself. I said, don't worry, mom. And I went to the vicinity of the presidential palace. And it, could, it was around already. It was very difficult to actually get in there. But I saw this absolutely everywhere. Shots were being fired all over the place. And by about 11 ish, we saw, I saw, planes, hockey hunters made in Britain, mm -hmm. going over the presidential palace towards the mountain. Chile is very narrow, it's like a long sausage. Kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the mountains are there, <coughs> the sea is there, you can't miss it. We don't have a sense of east or west. <laughs> For us, it's north and south, nothing else. <laughs> Towards the mountains, and then they came back down, flew very hard against the presidential palace, and bombed it. Again, and again, and again. And they never missed, which is amazing. Every time they hit the palace, the ground down your feet shook. I remember, you know, feeling that sense of instability. Not just political instability, actually, <laughs> physical instability. It was very frightening. You can imagine the way it must have felt by the people who were inside, including our president. By 11 something, you know, the palace was in place. And we do not know because the information is kind of contradictory. We think that the president possibly died at about 12, 1 o'clock roughly. By then, every single headquarter of left-wing political parties in the whole country had been attacked. Uh, many of them have been set on fire. This is the kind of thing, you know, politically consistent, but the opposition in Venezuela has the second thing. And they executed people on the spot. Many. They attacked every single newspaper that was associated or affiliated with the government. Every single one of them. And they did the same. Attacked them physically, used bombs, set them on fire, and executed as many people as they could. They did the same with the television channels that were part of the state television channel. What the position tried to do with Venezuela, the television, in April 2002, and they tried to do that again now. So it's very consistent. It comes from one single source. It's called the State Department of the United States. By about one o'clock, suddenly the television went funny. And you heard you got these landscapes. Chile is a very beautiful country. You should visit it once. <laughs> and there was military music. And all of a sudden, these four military guys appeared on our television screen. And they told us they were the government. <laughs> 
And they said very clearly that they were the government and they were not going to accept any kind of dissension, resistance, opposition, and they, they emphasize of any kind whatsoever. Any such attitude by anybody who be dealt with, they said, by people being executed on the spot. They kept using that phrase. It's quite terrifying. You think, wow, I've been, I've seen a lot of films on television, and this is real. Um, by then, it, one o'clock, it was dangerous to stay around the presidential palace. We were around the people up. Many ministers already have been taken. Some of them have already been assassinated. <coughs> and they were rounding up people up, absolutely every part of the country, particularly in Santiago. And they did not have enough detention centers. So they have to use the football stadium to put Damn. people in there which they kept in thousands. And then it was used as a torture center, also an execution center. I left towards the north of the city, it's a place I knew better. And as I crossed the river, the Mapocha River, it's a very ugly river, by the way. <laughs> um, I remember seeing corpses floating away of people who have been already killed and thrown overboard. By three o'clock that afternoon, Chilean democracy was completely, totally, and absolutely destroyed. We in Chile took more than 120 years of struggle. Workers organizing strikes, <coughs> people demanding rights, getting better legislation, you know, sacrificing ourselves. The peasants went on, on the move. Uh, unions were organized against the witches of the ruling class. It took a great deal for us to build that quite reasonable democracy, I would say. It was so reasonable, our democracy, that it allowed the Marxists to be elected to the presidency, which is something that the United States never tolerated. By three o'clock, a regime of brutality descended over the country. And it was going to stay there for 17 years. I stayed in Chile for six years, and it was quite risky. I didn't do anything illegal, <laughs> if you see what I mean. <laughs> I never have done it. There's a camera. <laughs> and um, the persecution, the fear, the assassination, the torture, you know, when your friends were coming out from detention centers, and then you saw they were not the same people. Hmm. Their soul has been taken out. Their eyes were different. They were depressed, down, didn't want to speak. And whenever, you know, I remember one occasion, we got one who wanted to get him happy, so we got him drunk. <coughs> this is a good way of being happy. <laughs> Only temporarily, don't want to do it. <laughs> and then he told <coughs> us what happened to him. I'm not going to tell you. But it was really shocking. And then we learned, you know, what was going on, doing what was being done throughout the nation. In 17 years in Chile, 10,000 people were assassinated. 10,000. That is pretty systematic. So the point I want to make is this. Where Venezuela to fall, and they're having a goal, it's like the 10th goal, and it's every time it's here. And it, the source is always the same. It's the United States of America. I can say that to the camera. <laughs> and the consequences of the U.S. succeeding will be absolutely catastrophic. Not only catastrophic for the Venezuelans, it will be catastrophic for the whole of Latin America. Because think about it. <coughs> Venezuela is a hard nut to crack. 
You know what I mean? You can block <coughs> Cuba. You produce sugar. Who wants sugar these days anyway? I had an app myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to blockade a country that produces sugar. Economically. You cannot blockade a country that produces oil. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the complications and one of the advantages, as well as disadvantages, in many other respects, that Venezuela has. The US have been thinking about, you know, should we do it? And then the main um, country that is going to suffer the consequences of it will be the US itself, very directly. The US is very thirsty for oil. It consumes something like 3.2 million barrels of oil a day. That's a lot of oil. And Venezuela is responsible for about 15, 20 percent of it. That's also significant. The whole East Coast will be totally paralyzed. You know, New York and these nice places. It's not functioning because there's no Venezuela. So therefore, the message must be that we have to be extremely aware of the actual strategy and the actual objective of what is being done against Venezuela today. If Venezuela were to go, and I'm going to say this very advisedly, it would be much easier to pick on Bolivia. Much, much easier. I'm not saying they're not going to defend themselves. They will. I know to the death. It would be much easier to pick on Ecuador. And I do those things. And it's extremely important, and this is the reason. I think the U.S. not only is declining as the Congress saw it in 2017, it is declining very badly, but it is declining in a way in which any severe <coughs> shock on the system can make it catastrophic. And I fear that those nutcases in the political class in the U.S. might just think irrationally and God knows what they might do. Because there are nut cases, absolutely, so many in there. And I'm not talking about crazy people who use the computers. <laughs> but you know, generals, the advisors of George Bush, these sort of people who are really nut cases, they're completely irrational. When the, the attack took place on the towers, Mr. Wolfowitz, the Minister of Defense of the United States went on television saying that they had a list of 50 countries they were going to attack. He said it. He said, we have the plan to attack 50. And he mentioned a few. Cuba was among them. And if he had got the permission from the White House and they had won the debate, they would have done it. And you know, Afghanistan was first, and then Iraq, and then they would have gone for it. So we have to be extremely conscious of this. The United States has a GDP that is 17 trillion. It's quite big. Venezuela is 400 billion GDP. Very big, but small compared to this monster. But the United States owes about 18, 18 trillion. And in about two, three years, according to the IMF, that usually I do not quote. <laughs> The United States is going to be number two. And China is going to be number one. Mm -hmm. The debt of the US at the moment <coughs> is about 110% of their GDP. It's but not comfortable, I'll tell you. The debt of China now is 16% of their GDP. Pretty nice. In 2015, the IMF extrapolated these figures, say that the debt of the United States is going to be possibly to 120 to 130. You see these debates in the Congress all the time. And every time the Congress debates, requested by Obama to increase the ceiling of the debt. So the US is getting more and more into debt. It's going to be 120, 130 percent. The China debt <coughs> in 2015 is going to be 9 percent. In other words, the U.S. is going down, this other one is going up. The U.S. is losing his hegemony in the Americas. And it's losing it very badly. And that's why it's reacting so good. 
And the point is this, is strategically, where the US to lose its hegemony in Latin America, it cannot call itself an empire because you haven't got the base from which to operate. Uh -huh. So therefore, every time one of our progressive governments takes a step towards more independence, every time that our governments get together and organize and intensify the process of the regional integration, every time that one of our governments takes away raw material from them, every time that one of our governments in Latin America expel the Yankees and tell them to take them big bases and stick them somewhere in the Ooh. US itself. <laughs> <laughs> really, it is a step forward, not just for us, Latin America, a step forward for humanity.